Good morning. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As we celebrate this Mass, we just have two uh, special announcements. We celebrate the Feast of St. Cataldo, and we have some members of the St. Cataldo Society who come every year to celebrate Mass here. That's a big, beautiful statue of a bishop that we have in the Hall of the Saints. Uh, so they're here to celebrate uh, the feast day of St. Cataldo. So we thank you for being here with all of us today. And also, um, uh, announcement, uh, James, all of you know, James Bonanno, has applied for entrance to become a priest of the oratory. So he will um, begin his formation in May at the end of the school year. So congratulations to James, and we'll be happy to have you here serving with us. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to my brothers and sisters that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Heavenly Mary, ever virgin, all the angels say, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me, the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Kyrie eleison. God of light, giver of every good gift, put into our hearts the love of your name, so that by deepening our sense of reverence, you may nurture in us what is good, and by your watchful care, keep safe what you have nurtured. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. You duped me, O Lord, and I let myself be duped. You were too strong for me, and you triumphed. 
All the day, I am an object of laughter. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I must cry out. Violence and outrage is my message. The word of the Lord has brought me derision and reproach all the day. I say to myself, I will not mention him. I will speak in his name no more. But then it becomes like fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it in. I cannot endure it. The word of the Lord. from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The word of the Lord. According to St. Matthew, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord. No such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he'll repay all according to his conduct. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. doing? So as I mentioned, uh, James is applying to the oratory. James is one of our parishioners. He's been in our parish for, I guess, a couple years now, right? A little over a year. So he joined the parish, and then he, now he's joined the oratory. <laughs> I like how that works. But so we have three guys now from our parish who are becoming oratorians, which is a great blessing. So hopefully we'll have many more. But the one thing we don't have that we'd like to have and we're praying for is some of the girls to become sisters. So think about it and pray for the girls of our parish because we'd like some of our girls to dedicate their life to the Lord Jesus and become sisters serving alongside of us. Obviously, we don't have women in our community, but we have a lot of beautiful communities that serve the poor and those in need and teach and run hospitals and do all sorts of great things in the church and the world. So let's pray for the girls too. Sound good? Yes. All right. Excellent. So this weekend, we're celebrating Labor Day weekend. And I thought it might be a good idea to take this opportunity to talk about a Christian vision of the economy and a Christian vision of work, the worker, being an employer, and all that kind of stuff. Because sometimes people can act as if, you know, that eight hours or 10 hours or however long they work during the day, that that's something separate from our faith, that that doesn't kind of really count in the scheme of things when it comes to living out our faith. 
But does that make much sense that a good portion of our day wouldn't be dedicated to the, would that make sense? Would it not be dedicated to the Lord? Absolutely not. And so today we're gonna to talk about a Christian vision for the economy because we have lots of political ideas uh, about and lots of political visions for what an economy should look like. But for us, it needs to be more important. What is God's vision for the economy and for work and things? So I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit today. And Jesus spoke on several occasions about work and faithful workers and employers and things like that. But he didn't do so to talk about the economy. Usually it was to teach a lesson on, on the Father's mercy, the Father's love, the Father's generosity. And he used things like a, a worker with his employer and things like that in his parables to tell us tell us about God and judgment and mercy and all of that. But when you read those, even though Jesus isn't specifically talking about workers and work and bosses and the economy, you can glean from the parables that Jesus uses what his vision of a true human economy looks like. So he wasn't giving us an expose on labor, but from that we can glean Jesus' view of work the worker and what it means to be employer. So first, Jesus' view of the employer. The word that describes it the best is extremely generous. I guess that's two words, right? Extremely generous. The employers aren't pushovers. They, they are very generous. They're not pushovers. They require the workers to work a hard day's work. But they're overflowing with generosity in Jesus' parables. Very often, Jesus uses the image of an owner or boss to speak about the father. He spoke, remember the parable about the owner who forgave a man a huge debt? The man owed him much money, and he was going to be put into prison if he didn't pay it back. And he went and he begged the, his boss to, to take it easy on him, and the owner forgave the whole debt. Remember that parable? Yeah. Well, that the owner paid off the, the uh, worker's debt. Then there's the other parable about the owner who goes out, the vineyard owner, who goes out in the beginning of the day and he hires workers to work in his vineyard. Then later on in the day, he goes out about midday and hires more workers to come and work in his vineyard. Then at the end of the day, he goes back out and for the last couple of hours of work, he hires a few more people to work in his vineyard. And at the end of the day, he winds up paying those who came last a full day's pay, even though they only had worked a couple of hours. Remember that story about the vineyard owner? Do you remember that? Yes or no? Very good. Well, these things are really important to give us Jesus' view about, the, about an employer. In both of these parables, the owner puts the good of the worker and the good of the worker's family at the forefront of his considerations. While this parable is about, these parables are about the God's mercy and generosity, it also shows us what God thinks about wages and generosity. Think of it this way, and I have a question for you. Shouldn't everybody who's working hard be able to support their families? What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. Doesn't everyone who works hard or who's trying to work their hardest, maybe they can't find a job, but they're really trying to find a job, shouldn't they be able to provide for themselves and their family? Absolutely. Like having a living salary, a salary that you can actually live on and take care of your families. Having health care, why should somebody not be able to go to the doctor when they're sick? Or taking time off, especially Sundays, to be able to come and worship God and to keep the Sabbath holy. Nobody should be working constantly, nonstop. Everybody deserves some time off, especially to worship God, to be with their families and to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And if their companies or bosses can provide even more, shouldn't they do so to help the families of the employees to thrive? Work has three purposes. The first purpose that work has is work gives us an opportunity to participate in the creative work of God. God is always creating, and when we work, we participate in God's creation and God's care of others. The second purpose of work it can help us grow in virtue and goodness. Don't you learn how to be a better person at work? Hopefully, you learn how to be a better person at work, right? To sacrifice, to do some things that you may not want to do, but to conquer your own wishes, your own things, to do something for somebody else or for the good of the company. Doesn't it teach you about responsibility, about being on time, about valuing other people, about looking for the gifts in other people? Can't work teach you all those things? It can help you grow in virtue and honesty and goodness. And then finally, one of the main purposes of work is to help 
families to thrive, not just to survive, to thrive. Now, both the greedy form of capitalism and the excesses of socialism and communism get it all terribly wrong. Because both of them see that the person and the family is, they see it, the person and the family as unimportant. They don't really matter. They're not really part of the equation when it comes to work or business or doing whatever. In a greedy form of capitalism, the worker is just a means to an end. All that matters in that form of capitalism is the bottom line. Profits are what matter most. The idea is to get the most, the greatest amount of work out of a person while giving them the least amount of salary or benefits in order to raise the profits for, for owners and shareholders. Now, profits aren't bad, but when they are put above the individual, above the worker and their families, then you got things out of whack. For, the, for this type of capitalism, the person is unimportant and profits rule. It's not only cruel, inhumane, and just, it's not even a smart form of capitalism. Because every good business owner knows that if you really want a thriving business, take care of those who make your business successful, right? So if you want, if you want a real form of capitalism that is life-giving and really is beneficial, then treat your workers well. Help them to thrive and their families to thrive, and they'll give you the best and they'll love you for it. For the socialists and the communists, the state becomes all important. When you read the, the writings of communists like Karl Marx, they speak about the worker in such glorious and glowing terms, even though Karl Marx never worked a day in his life. They speak about the worker in such glowing and glorious terms, but yet their policies and their ideas tear at the family, which is the center of civilization. The state becomes all important. The philosophy of communism and socialism, if you want a good image for it, just think of a 1950 Soviet-style building. You know what they look like? Those big concrete masses of ugliness and brutishness? That's the heart of communism and socialism. It's brutish. Socialism and communism have the tendency to destroy initiative and inspiration and a person's sense of self-worth as a contributing member of society and their community. They undo the person slowly, and they replace the warmth of the family with the coldness of the state. The state becomes all-encompassing. It becomes a new family, even though it doesn't treat you like a member of the family. Neither a greedy form of capitalism nor communism or socialism offer a truly human economy. Neither one works. What is needed today, most of all, is a Christian economy, a truly human economy, where the thriving of the person and the thriving of the family is at the center, where that becomes the most important consideration of that economy, where families can enjoy life and have the freedom and availability to worship God together and enjoy the fruits of the things that the Lord has given us, where families can enjoy life together. But now what does each worker owe in return? Remember the story of the worker whom the Lord puts in charge of his vineyard? And he goes away for a while. Jesus says, blessed is that worker whom the owner finds working on his return. You know, because sometimes, you know, in, in work and things, when the cat's away, what happens? <laughs> the mice will play, right? Maybe people don't take their work as seriously. Maybe they fool around, maybe they do other things, whatever. But sometimes it happens even when the boss is right there. You know, I sometimes am online at places or I'm going to, you know, some, some stores or whatever, and I see workers there and they're like this, on their phones, right? We're talking to this one and telling us, all right, hold on a second, hold on a second. Well, that's just simply unjust. It's stealing from your employer. That's the time that your employer has, uh, that has earned, that is paying you for. And so not working, doing those things uh, is not just. We owe our work the most thorough job that we can possibly d do. To use all the gifts that God has given us to do good and to do a thorough job. To be on time, to work hard, to do our best. Supporting and developing the company or the organization or the institution or the place where we work. It means helping your employer to thrive as well. 
It means focusing on our work and not taking time away from our jobs to do personal things, unless, of course, we have permission to do so or do things unrelated to work. It means using our workplaces to practice kindness and mercy and love at work and bear witness to our faith by what we say and do. It means being honest, being just with others, being upright and practicing Christian virtues, treating others the way that we hope to be treated. There's so much more that could be said about a Christian understanding of work, the worker, labor, and the economy. But that's it for right now. The main thing to remember is, first of all, that our work is not separate from our faith life. If it is, then we got things out of whack. If we're not living our faith in our work, then we're not truly living our faith. If you want to read more about what the church believes about work and the work or what Christ has taught us, there's, a wonderful, there's many wonderful encyclicals about this. One is Rerum Navarum, which was written over almost 100 years ago, I guess. And the other is an update to that by Pope John Paul II called Laborum Exergens. It's an excellent document. You can just Google uh, Pope John Paul II uh, encyclical on workers. And it's a beautiful encyclical. But for now, as you celebrate Labor Day on Monday, let's just remember this. A truly Christian understanding of work and the economy keeps the thriving of the worker and the family at the center all within any system that supports the thriving of the person created in God's image and the family that God created as a nucleus of society. All that supports the thriving of each of these is worthy of humanity. All that is not needs to either be discarded completely or purified and transformed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, to God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on third and on third day, according to the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. Amen. And let us present our needs to our Heavenly Father, for the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop David O'Connell, and for our priests and brothers, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the men and boys of our parish, whom God is calling to be priests and brothers, especially in the Red Bank Oratory of St. Philip Neri, and for the women and girls whom God is calling to be sisters, that they have the courage to say yes to him, we pray to the Lord. For Brother Zachary and Brother Anthony, 
and James, who are in formation for the oratory, and for our diocesan seminarian, Brian, sorry. That the Lord give them the grace of joy and perseverance in their vocations. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear for husbands and wives and widows and widowers, that they may lead their families to greater holiness and fidelity to Christ and his church. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the poor, the sick, and those in need, that the Lord may inspire in us new ways of serving him in them. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the deceased members of our families and parish, and for those who have no one to pray for them, that our prayers may accompany them as they are prepared for paradise. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For the special intention of this Mass, for Charles L. Yoko and Joseph Albert Latorto, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, with faith and trust, we place all of our needs in your loving hands. We ask in your kindness and mercy that you please hear and answer us according to your holy will, through Christ our Lord. Second collection today for maintenance and repairs. The offertory hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 206, O God Beyond All Praising. That's number 206. And at this time, we invite the children to bring their gifts to the altar.
brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May this sacred offering, O Lord, confer in us always the blessing of salvation, that what it celebrates in mystery, it may accomplish in power, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you so love the world that in your mercy you sent us a Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so you might love and love us when we love your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. By the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, except from the rising of the sun to its setting. A pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, grace and make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper is ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, 
the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to your second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son, and filled with this Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so we may obtain an inheritance with your life, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father, St. Philip Neri, with St. Anthony of Padua, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant, Francis our Pope, and David our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. <clears throat> through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father. Grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, 
we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Live in the kingdom and the power and the glory of yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grace and grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed to those called to suffer of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room, but only to say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
22nd Sunday of Ordinary Time can be found in your pew missile at page 231.
Let us pray. Renewed by the, the bread from the heavenly table, we beseech you, Lord, that being the food of charity, it may confirm our hearts and stir us to serve you and our neighbor. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I just have a couple of announcements. The 50-50 uh, tickets and the Columbus Day Dinner Dance tickets are on sale in the entrance area of the church. And let's see, is there one more? Um, Our Lady of Sorrows is Friday, September 15th. The Seven Sorrows of Mary, uh, the Rosary of the Seven Sorrows of Mary will be prayed in the church from 3 to 4 p.m. So that's on September the 15th. The Lord be with you. And, with your and the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. God. Have a wonderful Labor Day. Thank you, Father, you too. The recessional hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 87. America the Beautiful. That's number 87.